All right, so we've installed Android Studio and we are presented, hopefully, with a welcome screen of some sort. Now, yours should look similar to mine, but don't panic if it's not. You'll have this option available for sure, which is to start a new Android Studio project. So go ahead and simply click that. Android is going to whiz and whir and do its thing until it presents you with your Android project. First of all, we'll go with our application name. What shall we call this? Ah, well, let's just go with my first app. And then we have this strange thing called a company domain. It's not really important at this point whilst we're learning, but it is important later because the domain actually tells the is, is a unique identifier in the app store. So all of your apps will have like something dot a website dot com. So, you know, we might call this my app dot personal site dot com. So it's a unique identifier. And where Android tends to use this is in places like if you have an app, say Instagram, and you want to open up Facebook, it might look for this identifier or, or do it a different way. There are other ways it can do it. But we're not really interested in that. And then, of course, we're going to put our project somewhere. So feel free to put it wherever you like. You can include C++ support, but that's sort of a topic for a different day. And Kotlin, which is the new language. But again, that's a topic for a different day. If I were you, I wouldn't jump in to learn Kotlin this soon. Java is plenty enough for anything you could ever imagine that you want to do. And the, the bonus of Java versus Kotlin is that there are tons of jobs out there in Java. Because everything in legacy, in banking, in finance, and stuff like that, a lot of it runs on Java. So you can get a very well-paid job in Java. So let's hit Next. And then it asks you where this is going to run, what do you want to compile it for. Now, if you're not a programmer, all that compiling means is it's going to take the stuff that you've written in code and it's going to translate that to what's called machine language. That's not necessarily completely true with Java because Java is a bit of a special case. But for now, just think of it as translating it to a language that your smartphone or your tablet can understand. That's what compilation is. Just translating it to something the machine can speak. It'll ask if you want to put things inside Android Wear, Android TV. You won't be doing Android Auto, I can promise you that. And Android Things, I don't even know what that is. That's a new option to me. I suppose that's Internet of Things. So with our phone and tablet, which is all we're going to concentrate on, generally these days, we tend to go with Android 4 and higher. And that's because a lot of new features came into Android 4 that allow us to do a lot uh, more things in our apps a lot easier with Java than if we went back, let's say, to Android 2, which isn't in this list at the moment, but it could be if we set it up that way. Uh, and the reason we choose 4.03 is because we have access to those features from any version of Android above that. So we'll just choose four for now and we can leave that as it is. Well, actually, before we go, I did say this was going to be a, a very detailed course. So let's get some detail. Down here, it says by targeting API 15 and later, your app will run on approximately 100% of devices. And if you click help me choose, it'll bring up a website that shows you what devices and how many devices run Android 4.03 and above. So if we selected, let's say Android 5 Lollipop, now you're limited to 71% of devices. So when you're choosing the minimum you can uh, run on, choose carefully at the start, right? If you have a really advanced app that requires cutting ed edge features, you won't be able to run on all Android devices. Just bear that in mind. So for now, that's enough of that waffling. Let's go to 4.03 and hit Next. And then it asks us to add an activity to mobile. Now, what on earth does this mean? Well, an activity is the base level of your Android app. So when your app fires up, it goes to look for uh, an entry point into the app. Because, you know, when you write a piece of software, your, when you run it, the, your 
operating system, that's the word I'm looking for, your operating system, needs to know what to show you. It needs to know where to start. And in Android, activities are what it creates in order to show you stuff and do things behind the scenes. And that's not a very good explanation. It's quite a tough thing to explain. But just by looking at these pictures, you can see what an activity actually is. Here we have a basic activity, which has a button. We have a bottom navigation activity where you can tap things at the bottom of your Android screen. We have something that's empty. We have full screen. Tons and tons. We have a maps activity. We have a login activity. And these are just templates to actually get you started with your app. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go up to the top here. And what we're going to do is actually select a bottom navigation activity because that's a new thing that's come to Android after much resistance over the years and hit next. Now this activity needs a name and this name is always going to be unique in Android because when you're programming away in Java and you say I want you to call this activity or that activity or create a new activity it'll need a name and if you have two names that are the same they're going to clash. Now the convention is and in Android is that we always call it main activity if it is the main activity. So it will always be alive no matter what we're doing, except in maybe very special cases, but we'll never cover those. The next thing we've got here is a layout name, and this is where it's going to store the file that takes care of what we see on screen. So we'll get to that when we come to it. And it needs a title which we'll just call main activity for now because we can change that later. Let's hit next and off it goes. It's doing its thing. So it's going to go and find all the stuff that it needs to do. I think that's finished. Well, it's got a done down here. So let's click finish. I'm not sure we should. Well, it's not doing anything. So let's click finish. And then let's wait for our very slow laptop to actually get going. There we go. So now it's going to go and get some extra bits and pieces. Gradle is related to the compilation, if I'm not mistaken. You have to forgive me. It's been a while since I've done Android and Java because I mostly use C Sharp and .NET using Xamarin to do cross-platform apps. So this is actually quite a good thing for you guys because if I have to start almost from or seemingly from scratch, it's not from scratch re really, then you guys are going to get the benefit of me trying to understand stuff as we go. And I'm going to make this course completely uncut. So you can see where I struggle, even as a professional developer, even as someone that got offered... I don't know, whatever, Facebook offered me a job, basically, and I turned them down because I, well, I like my free time, and Facebook have a bad reputation for 12-hour days, 14-hour days. Anyway, that's all in the past. Well, I guess what we could do whilst this is all downloading is, I don't know, give you guys some general knowledge about applying for jobs if you're a programmer or freelancing. If you learn Android really well, you learn Java really well, and you understand the concepts that I'm about to teach you, then you could apply conceivably for any object-oriented programming job, or probably almost any programming job, even if you have you only have a cursory knowledge of it. So you could go into Python development. You could go into iOS development. You could do almost anything. And that's the beauty of learning Java or C Sharp, is that there are loads and loads of concepts that are common across all these platforms, across all these frameworks. And once you know the patterns, then actually learning the language is really just, it's a piece of cake. Don't, don't have to put a lot of effort in. It's just syntax. As long as you understand how to make something, you understand what those bits and pieces are that come together to make that thing, well then you're set. You're a programmer for life, you can learn anything, and you can get pretty much any job that you want. All right, once that has finished doing what it's going to do, and don't worry, it takes a very long time, maybe five to ten minutes to actually get the first 
project sorted out, you should be presented with a whole bunch of screens, panels, and if you expand this little app thing here over on the left hand side, we have things called manifests, we have Java, we've got, just got tons of things we can look at. We've got that main activity, if you recall we created that, and we've got these various tests that we have. We're going to ignore the tests for now, uh, but if you turn into a, a professional developer, tests are something that are quite important to ensure that your app is actually working as it should, or rather the components are working as they should. We also have this folder down here called res, which, well, let's go and explain what all this means actually. So first of all, we have Java. Now Java contains files inside of folders, and if we open up the main activity one, double click it to open it, we're presented with a whole bunch of code. That's fair enough. And we can close that in the right pane just by hitting this little X. But also we have this res folder. Now the res is different from the Java folder because the res sh is short for resources. And resources are things like images, things like menus, stuff like the layout of our app. And that's a core concept in a lot of programming languages these days is we separate what's called the business logic. So that's all the things that your, your programming will do like calculating stuff, adding stuff, fetching stuff from the internet. We separate all of that business logic from the actual display of the app. So in programming we do this a lot. We find a core concept and we separate it out from all the other stuff. And the reason that we do that is that if we change one thing, we don't want it to be kind of intertwined with something else, so we end up changing two things. Because if you change two things, that second thing might be sort of intertwined with a third thing, so we'll have to change the third thing, and so on, a fourth thing, fifth, sixth, seventh. And eventually, your program gets into a big mess, and things happen like it crashes all the time and you just don't know what to do about it. That is colloquially known as spaghetti code. Everything's interconnected and a big tangled mess. So coming back to these folders, our Java folder contains the actual code and our res folder contains things like layouts, images, things that we can draw on the screen. So you'll notice the first folder under res, resources, is called drawable. And if you expand that and you double click one of those items that's there, you'll notice two things pop up. First, we have this file, and this is called an XML file. It's simply a way of defining stuff. We're not going to worry about the syntax for now. Don't need to, to think about that for now. But what it produces is over there on the right hand side that strange black dashboard icon. And we can do the same if we double click the home. We have a home icon as well. Okay, so we can close those up. Now the reason that things are drawn in XML in Android is so that we can make them as big as we want or as small as we want without worrying about pixelation. Because remember when you expand a small image you start to see pixels, which of course is a very bad user experience and we've moved on from that since the 90s. So that's the drawable folder. What else do we have? We've got layout. Well a layout, and we actually have this one open currently, is what the user is going to see when the activity associated with that layout is loaded. Right, so here we have an activity and this is generated automatically for us and this uh, little pane on the right hand side slash middle is showing us what it looks like. And if you look down at the bottom we've got a design and we've got a text tab. If you click the text tab it shows us what these things are and so you should know by now this is XML it's just defining stuff. If we scroll down we can see there are various elements that are defined in there. Again, I won't go into this right now. But what I will show you is that this main activity is actually linked, despite what I said earlier, to the main activity code file. So if we double click and open that, 
then you will notice that somewhere in here, where are we? Let's scroll down. There is a line here called, don't worry about the stuff that surrounds it for now. This line is called set content view. And what it's doing is it's going to the resources, which is just R for short when we're doing this. It's looking in the layout folder and it's finding the layout called activity main, which is exactly what this is called. So that's how we connect our sort of our code for the view and the actual view itself. Okay, so that's that. Again, we're not going into details. In the menu, you might guess what this is for. This simply gives us a list of menu items. So whenever we want to call this menu, we'll have our code separate and we'll say inflate this menu and show it to the user and we can do something with it. We have mipmap and if we expand these, these are the items, the icons that show when, for example, our app is installed on a device and we have the, the icon for the app shown prominently. So we don't really need to worry about that for now. And finally, we have values. Now, this is a very useful folder. We can define colors. We can define dimensions, strings, and styles. Now, three of those should be pretty obvious, but strings might not be obvious. What is a string in programming? Well, a string is simply a bunch of text. In this case, this string is my first app. Now, in many programming languages, we would define a string by saying something like this, this is my string, and we would put these quotes around it. That's, the def that's how we would define a string in other languages. So basically, all you need to know is that a string holds a bunch of characters. It can be text, it can be numbers, but it just holds a bunch of characters. So that's what strings does here. Now, you can imagine this is very useful if we want to translate our app. We can have a bunch of strings that refer to Spanish, French, English, and inside of our code, we can just say, go get the string for hello. And so it'll go off. It'll say, wait, what language am I running? I'm running Spanish. So it'll go look for hello, but it'll pull out the Spanish version. Okay. So we'll close all of that. And that's pretty much it. Then we have this little Gradle scripts, but that's to do with building our Android app and we're not going to go there. Okay, so now we're starting to get to the real meat of Java and Android, but in particular Java. So just a very quick recap. We've got inside of our app folder, we have something called manifests. We're not interested in that right now. We got a folder called Java and another one called res, which holds our resources. So for now, we're just going to hit the little triangle icon to close those. And we're going to head over to the Java folder. And then we're going to go over to this first folder. It might not be the first in your list, but it's the first in mine. It's the one that contains main activity. And if you double click it, it will open over on the right hand pane. So now you're probably looking at this if you've never programmed before and thinking, what does all of this mean? Well, we're going to actually start at the very top with a keyword that appears, well, so often that it's almost ubiquitous in programming. And that keyword is called class. Now, what is a class? Well, I made a YouTube video about this actually, and it's one of my most watched YouTube videos because people get very, very confused between what a class is and an object is, and those two things are related. We'll cover that in a second. So. What I want you to think of a class as is simply a container for a bunch of code. That code could hold things like strings. Remember, we discussed that previously. It could hold things like methods. Now, all a method is, and here's an example down here of the onCreate, a method is yet again another container that sits inside the class container and the method allows you to execute some code. So if you ran this method, which is called onCreate, it would run this line of code, then this line of code, and so on until it had run through them all. Now, it's not always linear like that, but that's the basic gist of it. 
a class can hold these things called properties. And a property is just a thing. You know, it's like, it's a sentence, a string. It could be a number, which we call floats or doubles. Don't worry about that for now. But it's just a thing, a little container that holds some data. So a class holds those. And a class also holds these things, which are called uh, event listeners. So these are pretty much the same as methods, except they only fire when something else happens. So when that something else happens, that's called an event. And this is listening out for that event and then doing something based on, you know, whatever input it receives. So we've got properties, we've got events, we've got methods. Don't worry about those. I'm going to explain those soon. So we're still focusing on this class thing. So the class is a container. And this particular class has a name called main activity. And no two classes can be called the same, generally speaking, in Java. There are some exceptions, depending on how we, we construct things. But that's by the by. We're not going to cover that at all. So we have this public class. And public simply means that the rest of our program can see it. It's public. It's visible. Anything else can access this class. It's called main activity. And here's something that maybe you didn't know about classes. When we say it extends something, and then it gives you a name of that something, which in this case is called app compat activity, what it's doing is it's going and looking for a different class called app compat activity, and it's giving this main activity class everything that app compat activity already has. So when we're talking about classes, this little container, it's not just a container. It can do other things. So in this case, it's, it's grabbing some code from a different class, and it's adopting it for itself. And you know that's happening because we have extends. And so our main activity has both its own code and the code for this class. Now, if you want to, you can probably go find where this class is, and you can look at the actual file. And I can't remember where exactly to go to get it. Find sample code. It doesn't matter. There was a way, but it will come across it as we go through this. So that's a class. It contains some code. It can inherit some code. And inheritance is a word you'll come across very often in Java programming. It can inherit some code to give the whole class new properties. Right, so that's a class. Now, where the actual confusion comes in is people talk about a class, they talk about an object, and they talk about an instance of a class. And everyone says, what does all of that mean? Well, it's really simple. When we have a class, it doesn't do anything by itself, right? That's a very important thing to know. It doesn't do anything by itself. What you have to do, actually, before I say that, I should say the class is the container, but the class is also a blueprint, right? So this is like having a blueprint, say, to make a car. And in and of itself, a blueprint doesn't actually give you anything. It's simply a pattern that you have to do something with. And in the end, you'll have an object from following that blueprint. And that's exactly what a class is. So in order to use all the code in this class and do all the stuff that it does, we need to create what's called an object. OK, so I'm not going to type the code here. But this is just so later on you know what I'm talking about when we create an object. What we do is we grab this main activity class and we say to our program, make an object from this blueprint called main activity, and then we can use that object according to how we've defined it in the code. Right, so the takeaway from this sort of rambling lesson, excuse me for the rambling, is that a class is a container for a bunch of code, a whole bunch of things, whatever it is, properties, methods, events, and we'll cover those. You don't have to know what they are right now. And you use a class by calling on it and saying to your program, hey, this is a class, it's a blueprint, make something from it that I can use inside of my Java program. 
So the next thing we're going to look at is something called a property. Now what's a property? Well, a property is simply a little box, a little container that holds something. So if I was inside of this class, and you can follow along and do this, or you can just listen, that's fine too. If we said private string, that's not going to work because we need a capital S. There we go, string. Let's just remove this other stuff. And we put something like my name is equal to, open quotes, grant. And then a little semicolon on the end. Right, so let's go run through this quickly. Private simply is telling our class that nothing outside of our class, so a different class, can't actually access this. When you say private, it means only the class that it's inside can do anything to that string. And that's very good practice in programming. It's called in, uh, encaps well, it's not called encapsulation, but it encapsulates the things that no one else should be able to touch. Right? So we always want to separate stuff in programming. Then we have this word called a string. Now I explained this a couple of videos ago a little bit. A string is simply a collection of characters. And we know we have a string, generally speaking, when we have quotes around a collection of characters. Then we have my name. And my name is simply the name of the string. So later on in my program, if I wanted to, I could use my name, I could refer to it, and I would get back whatever it is. Then we have equals. Now equals in programming is called an assignment operator, if I recall correctly. I'm not too good at the, the, the jargon of this. And all that means is that it's going to set something. So you've got my name, it's going to set something to my name. Whoopsie, let's remove that. And what's the thing it's going to set? Well, it's going to be this string called grant. And Java knows implicitly that this is a string because there are quotes around it. So if I did something like remove the quotes, it's not going to work. We're going to get a red error and lots of light bulbs that say you're doing something wrong. So let's undo that. Whoops. Undo that. And we have my string. Okay, so this is a property. A property is a box that contains something of a specific type. So when we have a string, we can't do something like store, say, a number, and we get an error. And if you click this little error, error or something pops up like this, it tells you you have an incompatible type. So you're saying, hey, I've got a string box, but you're trying to put a number in it, and in this case, this number is an integer because it's a whole number. And Java doesn't like that. In fact, most programming languages don't like that, apart from JavaScript, which is the odd one out. So let's undo that, and let's have simply grant. Right, so let's try and create another property. And in this property, we're going to store a number. So let's have private. And let's see what happens if we just start typing stuff like number. Well, we do have a number, but I don't think this is going to give us what we want. But let's try it. My number is equal to 9. Now, if we hover over the number 9, hopefully we'll get a little pop-up. No, that's not working. Let's see what this little thing says. No. Well, we can have a number. So we can define it as a number. But a number is sort of generic. You might do this occasionally. But a better way to do this is to define it, let's say, as an integer. And an integer in Java is simply a whole number. So 1, 2, 3, 4. They're all integers. 1.1, 2.2, they're not integers because they're not whole numbers. So that's an integer property. And of course, we can keep going down this rabbit hole. We can have a float. And we can call this my num is equal to 2.1. And suddenly, that doesn't work. Because when you write 2.1 in Java, Java says, hey, that's a double, which is a different kind of decimal point number. And what you've said is, this should be a float. 
So you have two options here. You can make this into a float or you can make this into a double. So you can redefine it and the errors all go away. Right, so I'm not going to get too into detail because it does get kind of boring and you don't really need to know it until you're doing something with it and then it's important. But just so you know, floats from memory aren't as accurate as doubles. So there are issues if you're making financial applications, these things are very, very important because you'll get rounding errors. Okay, so what other things have we got? Well, instead of writing some more stuff about properties, let's have a look at this top line. We've got a text view. Now, what kind of property is that? Well, clearly, it is a text view. And maybe if I hover over it, or click the bulb. No. Come on. I don't know where my hovering uh, thing has gone. It's been a while since I've used Android Studio, as you can probably tell. Well, a text view is simply something that appears on screen. So if we drill down into our resources folder, we go to layout, and do double click activity main. Notice that in the XML that pops up, we have something called a text view. And a text view, if we click over on the right hand side where the mouse is, has the message home in it. So as you might guess, it's simply a view that hold text that holds text. But the Android or the Java underneath needs to know exactly what that is and how to deal with it. So Android has a special property called text view that we have defined here. So again, that's a property. These are simple types of properties, you know, just a number, an integer, and a string. That's a more complex type of property that contains a lot more information that's kind of shuttled away and that we never see, but that we can use when we're manipulating a text view. So that's a really short overview of properties inside of Java and how we can define properties. And I haven't really covered how we can change properties, but we're going to do that as we go. All right, we are still inside this main activity.java. And we've discussed what a class is, and that may be as clear as mud at this point, but don't worry, it'll become clearer. We've discussed properties, and that should be quite clear to you. It's just a box that holds something. So for now, I'm just going to remove these, these properties. We're not actually going to use them. You can simply delete them. But make sure you leave the text view there, or whatever was there when you started this project. Then as we scroll down, we have this other thing called an event. We're going to ignore that for now. Let's just forget that block of code. We're going to instead focus on what's called a method or function, depending on which language or what the vernacular for your particular language is. Now, all a method is, is yet again, another container that holds the things, the bits of code that you want to execute. And methods need to sit inside of classes, inside of their own container. They can't sit sort of outside of that. So there's a strict hierarchy. We have classes and then methods sit inside of classes. So this particular method has a bunch of keywords that we'll discuss in a second. But for now, there's a method name called onCreate. And this method fires automatically when we start our Android app. And all onCreate is doing is it's saying uh, we're creating this activity. As soon as you've created it, I would like you to fire off this method. Now, this method is a little bit of a special one because it's tied in with the Android, what we call life cycle. So, you know, as you load something on your Android phone, it's not a case of it's on or it's off and then it's on screen, but it's a case of it's, it's been tapped, it's getting ready to load, it's loading, it's about to show you what it's loaded, and conversely, when we exit out of an app, it's about to exit, and then it is exiting, and then it has exited. So these are all what we call lifecycle hooks. We can do stuff as we're exiting and entering apps. And for the most part, we're not going to do that apart from maybe save a bit of data, because obviously when you shut down an app, 
you'd like to open it in the same place each time if you're creating a good user experience. So coming back to methods, sorry I got sidetracked there, this is a method, it has a name, but a method also has what we call a return type. So when you create, when you execute a bunch of code in this method, you might want to give something back from the method. And when you do want to give something back, there'll be this little keyword, this type rather, before the name of the method. In this case, it's void. Now, if you think of just normal terminology, a void is nothing. It's a hole or it's, it's worse than a hole as well. My English ain't too good, but you know, it's a void, there's nothing there. So this method is going to return nothing. But if you think about our types, we could say, I would like this method to return a string. And this is gonna give us an error because one, uh, this, this method is part of the ecosystem, so we can't just go around changing it. But two, we're not actually returning a string. But if we were going to return a string, we would type something like return, and we would give it a string, and then we give that back. Now there's still an error because, as I said, this is a special case method. So what I'm going to do is just put all of that back to how it was, and then just below here, we'll create our own method. So we will we'll have private, so the method is only visible to this class. And what we'll do is say nothing will come back from this method. And we will call this method, say, hi. Okay, now a method, when you define it, has two brackets that come after it. You can leave those brackets empty if you have nothing to give the method, right? But if you have something that you want to pass over to the method, you can say, here is a string, let's get that capital S, and we'll type the name of the string, which is message. So if you can actually pass data around your application, and this keeps things nice and tidy, because you're saying, here's some stuff, and the method's going, all right, I'm going to do something with that stuff. And then what do we do with methods? Well, we use these things called curly braces. You'll find that sort of on the top right of your keyboard. You might have to press shift to access that particular curly brace. And when you type one, the other one automatically fills in within Android Studio. And when you press enter, it formats it all nicely for you. Right, so we've got say hi and we have a string message. Now here, we would type some code and we would execute what the function actually is supposed to do. And we're not gonna type any code because, you know, we, we, well, we don't need to. Now, just before we finish this lesson, we'll go over that thing that I talked about previously where we're going to return something from a method. So how do we return something? Well, this can't be void. It has to be a type that we're going to return. So we know what we're getting back from the method. So we know how to handle it wherever we're using the method. So let's say we're gonna pass back a string and we'll, we'll take away this stuff in brackets and we'll change the name of the method to get hello message. Okay, and now of course there's a little red mark and it says missing return statement. So we will return, hello new user. And now we have our message returned. I, I can spell honest. So whenever we use this method somewhere, and we'll cover that soon enough, we're going to pass back a string saying, here you go, here is the message you requested. Okay, well actually we could sort of fire that off now. So somewhere in our onCreate bundle, what we're gonna do is underneath the very last line, we are going to do what's called executing the method. And the way you execute the get hello message 
is simply by typing it, get hello message with the brackets at the end and then put a semicolon on. So now this is going to get that message for us. So now we can come back to this idea of properties. So we can get this hello message, but if we don't give it to a container, a property, it's not going to do anything. It's kind of useless. So let's try string message is equal to. So if you recall from our properties lesson, this is a string container. It's going to go execute this method. So it comes down here and then it returns this string. And then now message itself will be that returned string. So you should be starting to get an idea of how we pass data back and forth, how we handle things, how we put stuff in boxes, right? So programming is all about putting stuff in boxes, making sure the boxes never cross each other. That's one of the most fundamental things in programming. Keep your boxes separate. If you don't, well, you're just you're in for a hell of a time because you'll never be able to maintain your applications. Okay, so we've got our message. And then if we wanted, we could do something with that message, like we could show it on the screen if we wanted to, but that's a lesson for another day. So that's the basic stuff covered in this lesson. So I'm going to stop the theoretical stuff at this point, And in the next module, we're actually going to get on and do some real programming and see what we've created on the screen itself. So just to recap, we've covered a class, which is a container, holds some code, holds methods, holds properties. And a class is also a blueprint that allows us to create things uh, from that blueprint. Okay, that's, I, I know that's probably not that clear at this point, but it will become clear. Then we have properties. Properties are simply containers that hold certain kinds of things. And then we have methods. And in this case, onCreate is a, a special method. And I haven't talked about these words before it, but don't worry about that for now. So these methods hold a little bit of code and that code executes something. It might pass something back. It might pass nothing back. It might go do something else on your behalf. The important thing to remember is methods should be as short as possible, right? So, or, or rather than short as possible, they should be only as necessary as they should be. That's a better way of putting it. So when I say get hello message, I just want one line to get that, right? And when your methods are shorter, it's much easier to keep track of what's going on. And it allows you to, <coughs> excuse me, to encapsulate everything. So, so everything, again, is neatly tidied away in little boxes. And that's how you become a good programmer, by squaring away everything in its own containers. Okay, so that's methods. It's just a block that holds some executable code. And other things inside the class can do what's called calling the method. They can or execute the function, execute the method, however you match those two together. And it can get a result or do something with it. All right, now we're going to get to the real meat and veg, or the meat and bones of running our Android app. So if you recall, we've run through what all the folders mean. We've run through a little bit of what classes are, properties are, events are, and methods or functions are. And that's all well and good, but sometimes it helps to have a look at what we're actually building. So when you install Android Studio, it should come with an Android simulator. Now to find out if you have a simulator installed, all you really have to do is click Run for your app. So there's two ways you can do it. You can go up to the top menu, you can go to Run, and you can run the app. You can debug the app, and there's various other things. There's also a little toolbar at the top right where we can run and access those same options. So what we're going to do is just simply run the app. So if we hit Play, it's going to tell us perhaps we have no devices or emulators detected. We have an available virtual device, and this is an Android Nougat device. But it tells us there's a missing system image. So let's see what happens if we click OK. It tells us we should download it. 
So go ahead, allow it to download, do its thing, and it will install that emulator for you. You'll have to jump through a bunch of licenses and it will come up with this dialog. And once that's finished downloading, uh, you should have this entry filled in. I actually downloaded a slightly different one, the Nexus 5 API 25. Now in Android, when we talk about the API and a number after it, that's actually just the version of Android. So you might know Android as Oreo, Nougat, uh, Lollipop, whatever it is. But behind the scenes, there's actually a number to specify each major release. Now sometimes you can have a major release, but it's still called Android Lollipop or Android 5 or whatever it is, Oreo, Nougat, etc. But if there's a major number change in the API, then you can bet that quite a lot has changed in the system. So that's just so you know that. So once you've downloaded it, select it and just hit OK. And your computer should go ahead and run this. Now, if it tells you that you need some various bits and pieces to run this Android virtual device, that's AVD, then go ahead and do that. So this is a common problem. VTX is disabled in BIOS. And what VTX is, if, I, if I'm correct, is it allows your Android simulator to directly access the processor, which makes it much faster. So it doesn't have to go through Windows. It can just go direct to the processor. And with Android development, the simulator is extremely slow. So I'm just going to hit OK. It is going to tell me that Instant Run requires the platform corresponding to your target device is installed. Well, we can go in ahead and install that. I mean, generally speaking, when you're creating uh, your Android apps for the first time, things won't quite match up. You know those API numbers I've just told you about? Well, they might not actually match up with what you're specifying your build to target. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it for now. But when it gives you some hints, just simply accept most of the hints because generally Android Studio knows what's going on and it knows what you need. Right, having run through all of that, I'm now going to click play, I'm going to click OK, and I still get the same error. So what I'm going to do is follow the instruction under troubleshooting, which is to enable VTX in the BIOS. We might also need HAXM, which is an Intel technology. So first of all, I'm going to reboot my computer and go into the BIOS. And for you, that might be pressing the delete key a few times, the F2, the F12 keys or the F10. It's all different depending on which computer, but generally I find delete works. So go ahead, restart your computer, and I'll see you in a minute. Right, here we go. I have now rebooted. I went into the BIOS and I enabled VTX. So here goes. Let's hit play. Okay, so it's initializing something called the ADB. ADB stands for Android Debug uh, I forget what the last word is, but basically it's how your Android Studio connects to an Android device. And it doesn't matter if it's an emulator that's the device or an actual device attached to the computer. The ADB is how it receives and sends data back and forth between the two or debug messages. So let's click OK. Let's see what happens when we try to run this. That looks good so far. So what you will have noticed so far is that a lot of development for any platform is simply sorting out the bugs even when you start just trying to run a simple app. So if you think you're going to be a software developer, these are the things you need to be prepared for and aware of before you sort of commit because a lot of people give up at these hard little bits. But, you know, after a few months, these bits aren't hard at all. It's just, it's par for the course, right? And when you have an error, these days, we have the internet, and someone will have had the same error, and you get lots of tips, especially on websites like Stack Overflow, on how to fix the various errors that you're experiencing. So whilst we're waiting for that all to initialize and boot, if we go back to Android Studio, you'll notice that down at the bottom corner, if you click it, actually, it pops up with this window, it says waiting for target device to come online. So that's simply waiting for the sort of hello message that should come back from the Android emulator or simulator. So of course this is going to take a little while and the Android simulator actually takes quite a lot of processing power. So if we look at our task manager in Windows, 
you'll notice we have a lot of CPU coming from this QMU system. And also a lot coming from Dropbox. I wish Dropbox would sort this out even when it's paused. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to exit Dropbox. There we go. That should sort that out. So it'll give us a bit more processing power for the simulator. And there we go. On cue, the simulator is now running. <laughs> That's Android for you. <laughs> you get a crash even as you load up your system. But notice in Android Studio, at the bottom right of the screen, it tells you it's installing an APK, uh, which I think stands for Android something, something. I can't remember what it is. Basically, it's a zip file, just a certain format of zip file that plugs everything together so it will run inside of your app. So here we have it, my first app. We have Home, and if you recall, if we go back to our app, we go to our res layout, and we double click Activity Main, that is the layout that appeared before. My computer's just uh, struggling with this task right now, so I'll give it a chance to catch up. But anyway, that's where that layout comes from. And then, of course, behind that layout, we are running our Java activity. And I think my Android Studio is actually frozen at this point. Oh, no, there we go. We got something. It just needs more processing power. So if we expand Java, mainactivity.java is what's running behind what we see on the screen here. So that's taking care of the, the business logic, if you recall. That's what I said. Now you'll notice there are three tabs at the bottom. And when we started this app, when we created it in Android Studio, we said create a bottom tabbed app. So it's done that by automatically for us. And if we click each one, it'll take us, go away, I don't care. It'll take us to dashboard. And if we click notifications, it will take us there. Now you might be wondering, where is this dashboard, notifications, and home? They appear to be three different screens. Well, let's actually go back to the code. And let's look in our main activity.java. And remember this section I told you was what's called an event handler. So this event handler simply looks for when we press one of the buttons on one of those bottom tabs, and it fires off this method. So it's just like a method, except it's got a trigger somewhere. And the trigger, of course, is when we touch the tab. OK, so that's simple enough. Once this fires, it goes into here, and it goes into what's called a switch case statement. So what it's doing is it's saying, I'm going to grab this bit of data that came in on this event. And the bit of data in question is called an item. So you see, whoops, let me undo that. We don't want to do that. Control Z. Oh, no, I think I've just put... Uh, Something strange there. I'll just close that. Let's reopen it. OK, so we're fine. So what it's doing is it's getting this item. And this item, and this is a concept in programming you need to come to terms with, is when we do something, when there's an event, usually a bunch of data gets passed to the thing that's firing off. Because you know when you click a button, in your program, you want to know which button you've clicked. You want to know what kind of button it is. You want to know maybe what's on the screen. You want to know a ton of information. So that's what gets passed in, the menu item called item. Then we have this switch case. So we get the item. And you'll notice this has its own method called getItemID. And as you might guess, that gets the ID of the item of a particular button. And then this is how switch case statements work. When the case is that the item ID comes from resource.id.navigationHome, and that comes from our menu navigation. So what Android is doing is it's going into the resource folder by R. It's looking for something that has an ID of navigation home. So if we open up this navigation XML, notice that this line defines an identifier. So ID is equal to some jargon navigation underscore home. So if we go back to our main activity, 
That's what it's looking for. So it's finding a unique ID. So if that's the case, i.e. we've pressed the home button, it's going to set the text as home. And now you might say, what text is that? Well, if we look up and we find M text message, and if you highlight anything in Android Studio, it'll highlight it up here for you, wherever else it exists. You'll notice we have the property, which is a text view. Right? And that's the only place that we actually have it. Or there's there's a couple, but I'll get into that. So we have this M text message, which is a text view. So if we go back to our activity underscore main and we find this text view, which has an ID of message, you'll notice that there is some text in it which is currently set as home. So that's what it fires up when we first open our app. And if we press the home button, it's going to set that text as home. Whoops, let's change that back. Let's see, edit. It appears I don't have undo. I don't know what's going on these days. Let's close that. And let's just put that back to what it was. It's doing very strange things. I think it's because we're running something. Anyway, so we have home. But what if the case is we have the ID of navigation underscore dashboard? So in our navigation.xml menu, that's that one. Well, if that happens, then it's going to run this block of code, which is put dashboard as the text. And if the case is navigation notifications, it's going to put notifications as the text. Okay. So there's also some other stuff here, return true, return false. We won't worry about that for now. I just want you to get this idea of the tabs. So when we're looking at our running app and we're pressing these, it's actually the same view that we're looking at, but it's just changing the text inside of that view. So that's important to note. Now, when you come to creating your own applications with this uh, layout at the bottom, every time you clicked it, you would actually load up either an activity, but probably not. You'd load up something called a fragment, which is, as you imagine, a fragment of an activity. But we're not going to cover that in this course just yet, because I just want you to get familiar. Right, so I think that's quite enough information for running your very first app. Just a quick recap on what we've done so far. We've fired up an app. We've looked at how these bottom tabs operate. We now understand where those tabs come from, from our navigation.xml. So we can close that. We understand that the activity main is connected to main activity by this line here. I don't think I actually told you that. Set content view. So we're grabbing that content view activity main, which is this XML file. Right, we now understand how to change text view texts programmatically. So in our main activity.java, we've got a switch case when we press a button. And in case the item is navigation home, we set the text of home to home. Same with dashboard and, of course, notifications. And I've done it again. Every time you double click, you've got to be really careful of double clicking in Android Studio because it will do a lot of stuff automatically for you, which might actually get you into a bit of a tailspin. So I'll just save that. So we've got our notifications. Now, currently, our app is still running. So what I'm going to do is stop that. In the top bar, you'll notice there's a stop button. So you can just go ahead and click that. And that should kick it off of our simulator. You can also do it by going into your Run menu and hitting Stop, which is grayed out because we've already stopped it. But of course, you'll notice all the options we have in here, and you'll get to those as you develop yourself as a developer. Okay, so the next part of this little tiny mini course, your little introduction to Android and Java, is to create our own extra little view. So if we go to our activity underscore main dot XML and we drop that little bottom bar. So over on the right hand side, there's a little uh, down arrow which points down. You can click it and it gets rid of that bar. You'll notice that we have a text view 
and we have this strange thing called a support design widget bottom navigation view. Let's not worry about that for now. But just know that every time you see the word support, it's giving you a feature that's newly introduced in Android, say Android 7 or 8, and the support library will automatically create that feature in previous versions of Android on your behalf, which is a great little feature that I really like about developing for Android. Okay. Now, what are we going to do? Well, we have this text view. And so what we're going to do is just run through a couple of lines and see what's going on. We have an ID. Now, you don't necessarily need an ID, I think. Well, let's see what happens if I remove it, if there's some kind of error. So let's delete the ID. And I can't see any red popping up. So we can undo that and leave the ID in. So you have an ID. You have a width. So this needs to know how wide it is in the view. When you say wrap content, it'll simply be as big as it needs to be. Same with the height. Now, there are different uh, versions of this. You can have something like match parent, and that will make it as big as the parent. And you'll notice over in the right-hand pane that actually makes it big. You can visually see it. So we can leave that as it is. That's fine. We can give it a margin for the start top left and also right. So that will position it away from the sides. So let's go ahead and do one of those. Let's say margin. and You'll notice it pops up with a bit of help. Let's have layout margin right as 16 dp. Now dp is a general measurement uh, for the... Instead of measuring pixels on a screen, because as you might know, Lots of Android devices have different amounts of pixels, different pixel densities. DP is a way of uh, standardizing those pixels, if you like, so your display always looks similar, even on different density pixel devices. Okay, so we've got our margin right. We've got our text still. That can stay there. And layout constraint left to left of, which is a bit confusing sounding, but all it means is that it's going to constrain itself to the left of the left of the parent. And you might be saying, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, I'm saying that about myself right now. So if you look at the left, we have this little lefty bit here. And if you just hover over it, a little red line appears. So what it's saying is, I want you to anchor the left of this display, text view in this case, to the left of the main display or the parent. So when it says parent, what it's referring to is one level up in the XML, which in this case, there's that support word again, is a constraint layout. Okay, so I'm not going to go into that right now, but just so you know, it's hierarchical. So we have this at the top, and then we have this just below it. Okay, and it does the same top to top of. So if we look at the top here, we have this little red line. And if you click it, it might tell you something. Mm, no, it hasn't. It's actually changed what was in our XML. So hit Control Z, and it will put everything back to how it was. Okay. So obviously, there are lots of things we can do up here. There are lots of tools that we can do to position stuff. We're going to ignore all of that for now. What we're going to do is copy paste this text view or we can click design down at the bottom and we can actually drag in some other stuff so let's drag in a text view so we can put this wherever we like on the screen and just release to drop it on the screen you'll notice we have what's called a text view now if you go to text it should appear down here but it's gone just below the bottom navigation view, which is no good. So what we want to do is we want to actually cut that. And we're going to place that up here. So now you'll see a little red error. And if you hover over it, it says this view is not constrained. When something isn't constrained, so it doesn't know where it sits in the screen, it's going to jump to the top left of the screen automatically, regardless of anything else. So let's go back to our design. Let's select our text view. And let's constrain it. 
So over here on the right hand side we have some constraint looking things. Now I haven't used this before so we're in the same boat here I don't know what I'm doing. But let's hover over the plus and create a connection to the left. And there we have it. So you'll notice in this little view here we have a line going from our text view to the parent. Let's do the same with the top. Hit plus and you'll notice it goes to the nearest element which is the existing text view. So now we've constrained it. Okay. You'll also notice we have a layout width where we can wrap the content and we'll just leave it as is. We have the text and we can change the text as we wish. Hi there. And we also have an ID right at the top called text view at the moment. We'll call this, let's say, hello message or perhaps just hello text view. Now why have I added text view to it? That is because when we come to the programming side of this, when we, we're in Java, we need a way to refer to the text view and sometimes when you're referring to something it's handy to have the actual type of thing it is in the ID. So as you're typing stuff out you know it's a text view and you know what you can and can't do with it. It's kind of a programming convention so always try to stick to that and that holds true for most languages out there. So if we go back to our text we now have that red error that's gone away and we have lots of bits and pieces that tell us where our text view is going to sit and what it's going to do. So the next thing to do is simply hit play. We'll run that inside of our Nexus 5 in this case on Android 7. Right there we go we have loaded it up and we have our hi there text. We can go to dashboard notifications and we have what we need. Right so that proves that our text view works. <coughs> Excuse me. We can stop that running and now we can change what that text view says. Because you recall we have an ID and if we go back to our main activity that ID will allow us to change or rather where are we looking at. Well, actually let me cover this bit first. So when we create it we grab that view, we create the view, then we say get our text message box, our text view and the way we do that is we call this function called find view by ID it goes off and finds that view which is resource.id.message so if we go up here it'll go and find that ID. Now you'll notice this doesn't have message text view. Personally I would put that in but you know everyone's got their own style for programming and it's a bit shorter if you don't add the type after it but I think it's quite good practice to add the type it makes everything much more clear and clarity is what you want when you're programming okay so we've got that message now coming back to our main point we want to grab this text view the hello text view and we might want to change it so how will we do that well let's go back to our main activity and notice we have no reference to that text view. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a property and by convention we hold the properties up at the top of our file. So we'll create a private text view and you'll notice Android Studio fills it in for you so you can just hit enter sometimes and we will call this M hello text view and that little mini M uh, I forget what it what it actually stands for but basically it indicates a property in Android and I think it's something to do with the actual uh, with one of the I'm losing my words here with one of the things we're displaying on screen but I can't remember exactly anyway just think of it as a convention and just put your M's in that's all I'm saying so now if you hover over that it says the private field M hello text view is never used and that means like it means nothing that's what Android's telling you it's telling you it's surplus to requirements so let's make it unsurplus let's go down here put some space in 
and let's have hem hello text view equal to now we'll start by typing find view by ID and then we'll say I want you to go and find the resource dot ID dot and what did we call it hello text view and you'll notice it says it finds this for you without having to run the program obviously and it has a special hex number that not by 7f blah 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 each thing on the screen has its own ID its own hex ID you don't need to know what it is you just need to know the name of it right and if you get that name wrong well Android will tell you very soon that you've got it wrong now there's one thing that's different from the line above it's this text view what it does text view the type inside brackets do what does it mean well what it's doing is it Android goes and finds this resource but it doesn't necessarily know what it is so you have to explicitly tell it this is a text view so if we copy that paste it in it will convert what it finds to a text view if it can so be careful here because if you put the wrong thing you'll probably get a crash or you know at least you'll get some kind of horrible error that you don't want to have in your app So we have our hello text view now that we've got it we can start putting some text in it so hello text view dot text and if you scroll down notice we've got some methods here called set text and that does exactly what you think it'll do set text open up your quotes and just type change text so save that hit control s so what we're going to do is we have this text view it starts with hi there but when we load our app we're going to have it changed to changed text so I'm going to hit play on that let's run it in our device and the reason we're doing this is just to get you familiar with how we actually connect the programming side of things, the Java side of things, with the display interface. Now, this isn't unique to Android. This happens everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So there you can see it working. We've changed our text to changed text. Right? So if we stop that running, go ahead, stopped. Conversely, whenever you selected your navigation bar at the bottom, you'll notice that we could actually change it here if we wanted to. Okay, so one final thing. Let's try and make this crash. So let's change this text view to something like, ooh, I don't know. Let's see what we've got in here. Perhaps a button. And clearly, it's not a button. Okay, but if we try and create a button, so let's go up. Let's change this to button. Oh, come on, Android, autocomplete for me. Button. So it should give us... Ah, that's improved since I've last done this. Previously, you would do this, and it wouldn't actually pick up that you're trying to access something that's not a button, but now it does. Okay, so I'm going to try and run this anyway and see what happens. Let's have that the same. Let's see if it actually lets us run this. bang so we have just experienced our first crash now why did that happen well, it's going to crash again isn't it if I keep doing that close app why did that happen because we try to make a button out of a text view and programming is very fussy if you do the wrong thing like that everything stops running so let's hit control Z change it to a text view and down here
There we go. So now if we ran that, it would be absolutely fine. But let's look down at the bottom here. We've got logcat, Android profiler, terminal. What does terminal say if we click it? Nothing. Android profiler, nothing. Let's allow access. So all these tools at the bottom are to do with seeing uh, what's actually running and what's gone wrong with our app. So, you know, I talked about the ADB. Well, the ADB is reporting back to Android Studio all the stuff that's happening with our app, <coughs> excuse me, and with Android in general. So you can scroll through this and it gives you a bunch of logs that have happened. And it tells you that something's gone wrong as our app is running. And there's just a whole bunch of stuff. Now this comes in useful later on as you start to develop Android apps and uh, you get lots of errors. The other things I've told you is that we separate views and business logic. We separate views and code in simpler terms. And the reason we do that is so when you change one, you don't really have to change the other unless you know they're loosely linked. And what else have we done? We've added our own extra text view. We've looked at how to change the text in that text view. So now you have a general idea of how the two things work. And it's, it's the same pattern, whatever you add to your views, you add buttons, you add inputs, whatever it is, you access it the same way inside of your activity or inside of your code file to speak more generally. Right, so I hope you guys have enjoyed this. And if you have, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't, give it two thumbs up. Uh, if you want to go further from here, then I'll throw in some links either in the description or, or somewhere that's pretty obvious where you can take the full Android course where it's, uh, you, you create apps from scratch and I take you all the way through up to publishing them on Google Play. So you'll be a published author, which is a great business card if you want to get freelance work or you want to apply for jobs. So once again, Thanks for joining me in this, and I'll see you around.